Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to EduSat live lectures. Dear friends, today's topic for discussion is political ideas of TH Green. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Dr. Satish Kumar Jha. Dr. Jha is an associate professor in Department of Political Science in Aryabhatta College, University of Delhi. Dr. Jha has 25 years of teaching experience and he, is specialized, he has specialization in Indian political thought and political theory. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Jha and request him to start the lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, today's lecture we are going to have on political ideas of uh, Thomas L. Green, popularly known as T. H. Green, uh, whose time period was from 1836 to 1882, uh, considered to be pioneer in terms of giving certain uh, new dimensions to uh, liberal political uh, philosophy and political thought. But interestingly, uh, Green is also referred as an idealist uh, who was influenced by uh, the ideas of a uh, great idealist like Plato, Aristotle, uh, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel and so on and so forth. And uh, one thing we should remember that when I have mentioned all these as idealists as normally they are referred, uh, there are differences among their thought and we can also include Kant in that category. But there are differences among them. Uh, for example, if Hegel in modern times can be considered uh, standing on one side of the spectrum uh, who subordinated individual and individual's identity to the state and authority. Uh, we have had someone like Kant who considered uh, individual and end in itself not as a means. In between there are many variations. Uh, so is the case with Green. Though Green is uh, referred as uh, sometimes as an idealist uh, political thinker or belonging to this idealist school. Uh, who looked at, uh, you know, uh, who believed in an organic model of society. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, one thing should be remembered that Green was a, a British uh, political philosopher. Uh, he was wedded to the philosophy of liberalism. Uh, the only thing uh, which he perhaps strived to do was to give a moral foundation to liberalism, which in his opinion uh, it lacked considerably. Uh, particularly on account of the fact that due to uh, the ascendancy or due to the predominance of utilitarian political philosophy, the moral foundations uh, could be built and it was hollowed out from inside. So, therefore, his entire attempt was to provide a moral foundation to this liberal philosophy and in doing so, he basically came out with some very interesting ideas, very refreshing thought and path breaking reflections uh, uh, to the same extent and in the same manner as perhaps John Stuart Mill tried to do uh, through his ideas and thought which we have discussed in our earlier lecture. So, T. S. Green therefore is interesting in the sense that his entire uh, you know uh, reflection or his entire ideas on moral freedom, his entire idea on political obligation, uh, the way he looked at the function of a state uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, are considered very important for understanding the evolution of modern political thought in the West, particularly the way uh, liberalism uh, you know uh, had a journey, intellectual journey and the way uh, in fact uh, you know some elements of idealism as a school of thought contributed towards uh, you know towards uh, flowering of liberal thought uh, in a manner or in a direction where certain social and other aspects uh, got added to it perhaps which you know it was uh, lacking earlier. So, therefore, Green uh, is quite important from the point of view of Western political thought in modern times. Uh, you know he came 19th century was his period, a period which is perhaps uh, remembered for uh, many uh, interesting ideas and many interesting uh, you know thinkers. Uh, in fact, uh, he was uh, a British English philosopher, a social reformer. Uh, in fact, uh, if normally you know we should also understand the background, the social background, uh, you know the peer group, the education and other aspects in terms of uh, the evolution of any uh, thinkers political ideas. If you look at Green, then you find that his father was a rector. Uh, in fact, he was born in Yorkshire 
now from paternal side he was a descendant of uh, you know uh, Oliver Cromwell and then he was edu educated at Balliol College Oxford where he also held the position of the professor of moral philosophy uh, particularly uh, you know during his academic uh, career. Now his contributions uh, have been far reaching particularly in area of political philosophy where he transformed, he tried to transform liberalism and worked out its moral foundation as I mentioned earlier. Now the influences we have already seen the whole host of influences one can see on him. Uh, in fact, uh, apart from the you know the great uh, thinkers, idealist thinkers, we can also see that what Jane, J. S. Mill, John Stuart Mill uh, was trying to do uh, through his ideas uh, by bringing a new dimensions to liberalism, which was reeling under the influence of utilitarianism of Bentham, uh, who, where basically only the happiness and the pleasure pain calculus mattered. And uh, Mill tried to bring in a distinction between uh, different uh, types of pleasure and happiness or different layers of happiness and pleasure. And he argued that pleasure uh, does not uh, differ only in uh, you know basically uh, in, in quantity, but also in quality and quality perhaps is a very important dimension of uh, pleasure and happiness that those who experience a better happiness, better pleasure, higher type of pleasure, they normally aspire to attain that pleasure. So, therefore, Mill you know uh, was also trying to uh, basically modify or at least do some corrections or at least suggest certain measures through which liberalism could be made more social, moral and could be the part of the larger uh, human uh, you know society. Now, uh, Green in fact went ahead you know a step ahead and basically worked out this moral foundation in a much more uh, you know uh, you know much more detailed fashion than perhaps uh, Mill was attempting. And in this context we find that he brings in duties, he brings in rights, he brings in political obligation and number of things. But one thing we should remember that in spite of his you know the influences which were on him particularly this idealist tradition, Mill uh, uh, Green when it came to the question of political obligation or the functions of a state, he remained a liberal to the core in the sense that he gave a limited uh, you know uh, amount of political obligation. Even he went to the extent of giving you know the right to resist and this is something very unusual for a idealist someone who subscribed to idealist school because a right to resistance is something which only perhaps a liberal would uh, you know uh, grant but Green was basically ready to uh, do that. Now <clears throat> as I was mentioning the context of Green's political thought. The context of Green's political thought was definitely the utilitarian uh, you know thought and philosophy. Now what is utilitarianism we have discussed in our uh, earlier discussions when we are discussing Bentham. Now utilitarianism as it is normally believed that basically is based on uh, the principle of self interest and happiness and basically this pleasure pain calculus which in his opinion was basically responsible for hollowing the British uh, liberal thought you know hollowing out the British uh, liberal thought. Now what happened uh, in fact Green therefore tried to rework this entire uh, liberal political philosophy and political thought. Now in that context what he did he brought in certain new dimensions of uh, you know freedom and rights which in course of time many people believe they were responsible for uh, you know the crystallization of ideas which were responsible for giving birth to this uh, welfare state. Now he in to some extent many scholars believe that Green can be considered as an architect of this modern welfare state uh, in terms of his ideas of providing state with some positive functions for creating conditions for realization of freedom particularly moral freedom which we will discuss later which in fact in certain other uh, you know traditions within liberalism are also known as positive freedom. So instead of just focusing on negative freedom which was the hallmark of liberalism for ages uh, in fact Green tried to work out a new theory and of the state and freedom. And therefore, we find that this welfare state which became a very you know popular 
uh, discourse in 20th century uh, in fact uh, uh, can be credited uh, to, 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 to Green in terms of uh, you know arguing that state has to create conditions for the realization of uh, you know freedom or one can say that uh, his entire concept of moral freedom was contingent on this fact that human beings are moral beings, moral agents uh, in, imbibed with will and reason and therefore they are social. They, they, they live in community, they have a community uh, you know consciousness and therefore all these things requires that a state has to function in order to create conditions in which the state you know human beings realize that freedom. Now, uh, in fact, for many scholars, John Stuart Mill and Green were responsible for redirecting liberalism from morally indifferent principle of laissez faireism to more humane and more society oriented discourse of uh, welfareism and so on and so forth. Because as liberalism, liberal political thought evolved in the West, in fact, uh, it was basically wedded to this philosophy of laissez faireism where the state was considered a basically necessary evil or in fact a night watchman version of the state or kind of the free market economy as normally we uh, basically refer to. But the thing is that you know these two political philosophers Mill and Green uh, basically wanted to redirect it that is liberalism towards a new orientation, towards a new discourse and that was the discourse of social welfare and that was basically uh, the bedrock of this entire uh, concept called a welfare state. In fact, uh, you know to great extent many people also hold Green responsible for uh, you know making uh, some you know making some suggestions particularly on issue of education, university education. Uh, in fact, to for many scholars in fact his entire philosophy was responsible for shaping the university education and public policy in Britain in 1880 to 1920 particularly the way you know the state took upon itself the responsibility of intervening in these matters. So therefore Lean's, uh, you know Green's political thought was not only its influence on, could not be seen only in philosophy but it was also palpable and visible in public policy discourse in England particularly after he uh, you know gave his ideas. Now before we move further it is also uh, you know uh, important that we should have a look at some of his important writings and the two writings which stand out in terms of basically putting before us uh, the core of his uh, of, you know philosophy and his thought. One is Prolegomena of Ethics it was published in 1883 uh, and then the next is perhaps which is very important from the point of view of political theory it is lectures on the principles of political obligation which was published in 1885. So these two writings on basis of these two writings normally scholars try to construct this entire uh, discourse around uh, you know our discourse of uh, Green uh, on different issues on freedom, on rights, on state on political obligation and so on and so forth. Now basically the entire aim uh, through these writings of Green was to create an inter uh, to, to basically provide or to establish the interlinkages uh, between uh, metaphysics, ethics and political philosophy and thereby basically create a framework through which the governance and the public policies uh, in society could be basically promoted. Now his entire argument. Uh, you know of course in a nutshell one can say that was well, that a state cannot make man moral but it can definitely create conditions for the moral upliftment of human beings. Now in fact when it comes it, you know comes to the role of the state the functions of the state uh, as it is oft quoted uh, it is often cited that Mill I mean the Green believed uh, that the role of the state is to hinder the hindrances that is the state has to remove the hindrances uh, from the path of moral uh, upliftment uh, or moral life of human beings in society. So hinder the hindrances that there are hindrances and the state has to put a hinder you know rather state has to hinder uh, those hindrances so that you know the all obstacles from the path of moral upliftment of human beings could be removed. Now coming to the most important issue in green that is the question of moral freedom. And what is this moral freedom in green? In fact, uh, in fact, uh, this is a key concept 
to understand so far as Green's political thought is concerned. Now, uh, this moral freedom uh, for many people, uh, you know, uh, is synonymous with positive freedom, positive liberty. Of course, liberty and freedom, this distinction sometimes gets blurred in green as it is, you know, is the case with other liberal thinkers. But one thing is very important that this moral freedom, uh, in fact, uh, is very important in his political ideas. Now, his entire uh, quest is to uh, offer a, uh, you know, a trenchant critique of negative uh, liberalism or then the concept of negative liberty, what I was referring to basically uh, originates from this discourse of laissez faireism. Now, positive liberty, uh, which many people believe is basically synonymous with this concept of moral freedom, uh, is basically uh, co terminus with uh, moral freedom, there is no doubt about it. But one thing is very clear that instead of using the term positive liberty, he uses the term moral freedom. And when he brings in this morality here, then basically he, ma he makes man or human beings a social uh, animal or basically the part of this larger uh, community life of the society. So therefore, this entire uh, in individualism, uh, which is the cornerstone of liberalism, basically uh, gets diminished uh, in Green's political thought. Now, this moral freedom according to Green is the distinctive quality of man, this moral freedom is a distinctive quality. In fact, if there is one quality through which human beings can be identified and recognized, it is the moral freedom. Now, uh, basically what happened uh, that, uh, you know, this, uh, this distinctive quality, uh, you know, which he talks of is something uh, quite significant here. Now, for Green, this negative freedom, uh, which was basically uh, dominating the scene when he arrived. Of course, as I mentioned that John Stuart Mill before, uh, Green also tried to uh, make some corrections uh, when he basically uh, tried to revise this entire utilitarian uh, discourse, utilitarian calculus by bringing in this concept of dignity and honor, by bringing in this entire concept of quality, the qualitative uh, quality, you know, difference in terms of quality of pleasure and happiness. But you know what uh, Green does that uh, he basically, uh, you know, uh, rubbishes or basically dismisses this negative freedom, uh, which uh, in fact is nothing but satisfaction of, uh, you know, the desire, uh, particularly own choice and will, uh, and uh, which was basically, uh, you know, so dear to, uh, you know, a political philosopher known Bantham who basically is considered the high priest of this utilitarianism and so on and so forth. Now, Green uh, even goes a step ahead of, you know, John Stuart Mill, who initially uh, realized this limitation, who basically tried to address this question, because it was a question for, you know, the survival and longevity of this liberal discourse, because it was, uh, you know, facing a lot of problems, because the entire social situation was changing in Europe. You know, the conditions were not now conducive for uh, the earlier philosophy that is basically this laissez faireism, utilitarianism, so on and so forth. So, in order to survive, uh, it required a new dose of, uh, you know, a moralism, and this is what perhaps John Stuart Mill tried to do through his concept of this developmental uh, freedom and the self realization. He gave importance to this personality, the human identity, the self realization. And he, he believed that not only this satisfaction of pleasure, not this desire uh, satisfying human beings are uh, basically uh, should be the reference point of uh, liberal theory, but rather human beings quest for dignity and honor, for higher grade freedom. And that is why this famous statement which is often associated with Mill that it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. It is better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. Basically, when he made this statement, his entire purpose was to highlight this thing, which perhaps was ignored by Bentham and his father James Mill. So, therefore, this attempt was made by John Stuart Mill. But what Green does, that he basically goes a step further and he basically, uh, you know, uh, makes a, you know, makes a, a statement that human beings do not seek pleasure directly. Rather, human beings are the rational agent and therefore, uh, there is a rational basis for all human activities and that has to be seen in will and reason. So, every human action has to be seen in terms of will and reason and it is not the desire or the passion 
which are the driving force of human action, but rather it is the will and reason which can be considered perhaps the governing principles of human action. Now, according to Gain, uh, you know, man seeks self realization, and uh, basically, that self realization in human, uh, you know, uh, perception is better than, uh, you know, simply the pursuit of uh, pleasure. So, therefore, what we find that Green considers human beings as a self conscious subjects, you know, endowed with this will and reason, unlike this entire utilitarianism, which believed it a pleasure seeking or desire satisfying as in the society. Now, it is on basis of this that Green believes that uh, you know there is an idea of good uh, and that idea of good is something which every human being uh, seeks to pursue. Now, what is this idea of good? Now, of course, uh, you know in the, within the liberal philosophy or uh, within the liberal discourse, earlier liberal discourse it was believed that there is an idea of good, but that idea of good varies from individual to individual, person to person and therefore, there is no general common good which everyone would subscribe to. But Green is not ready to accept this position. For him, this idea of good does not vary from person to person, rather you know, uh, you know there is a common good, there is a notion of common good and that is largely on account of the fact that human being is a rational animal and is a part of the larger community and larger grouping in the society. Now, this man's concept of good according to Green uh, coincides with each other. This is basically uh, very significant in terms of uh, the larger uh, you know argument which he uh, provides later that man concept of good coincides with each other that human beings are basically man is a social animal this is nothing new in fact as uh, as early as you know ancient greek period when aristotle uh, is credited with this statement but what green says that because of uh, you know this uh, nature uh, of human being that there is a concept of good and that concept of good every human being shares with others in the society that what happened that you know uh, you know because of this commonality of interests uh, there is a because you know these in the human interests are not in conflict with each other all the time rather there is a commonality of interests uh, and therefore because that commonality is the basically uh, the bedrock of institutions and because this commonality one can say is the parent of all institutions. Now, Green said this idea of good uh, basically uh, in, you know basically Green believed that individuals share this idea of good with each other and that is perhaps the parent of institutions, uh, usages and social judgments. And it is on basis of this uh, you know the shared ideas of good that uh, Green comes to this conclusion that there are duties. Uh, in the society and individuals voluntarily and willingly accept those duties, rather those duties bind them together. Now, those duties individuals accept their as the duties towards other members uh, as self realization, which is perhaps one of the mission of every individual in society is possible only when they behave uh, as a consensus uh, members of the society, where the interests of different uh, you know members of the community are not at cross purposes, rather they contribute towards the fulfillment of the self realization of each and everyone uh, in the social context. Now, therefore, what we find that in green this usage of self realization uh, basically uh, you know is a very important concept and this usage of self realization uh, was informed by the sense of duty that everyone every individual wants self realization, but that self realization is not bereft of duty, but rather they are basically it is tied with duty, it is contingent on duty, it is intimately related to duty. Now, this entire discourse which basically uh, you know materializes in green in terms of self realization on the one hand and duty on the other basically leads to something what we normally uh, you know are familiar in political theory as positive freedom. That freedom is not simply absence of restraint. Freedom does not mean only satisfaction of self interest, but freedom also implies uh, certain responsibilities towards other, certain duties towards other and this is how uh, basically this entire concept of positive freedom has been understood in political theory. So, this concept of moral freedom 
basically green uh, brings in this entire dimension at the center of uh, political uh, discourse. Now, for green this positive freedom uh, basically uh, you know requires that a state in which man shall have realized his ideal of himself uh, shall be uh, one with the law uh, which he recognizes as that uh, which he ought to obey. Uh, in fact, uh, this is something uh, also quite uh, significant here that one with the law that law is not considered external law is not considered uh, you know basically exterior to it rather you know he believes that positive freedom which basically he builds the foundation with the help of this entire discourse on moral freedom he believes that a state uh, the you know a state comes into the picture but a state the ideal state is one in which the man shall have realized uh, his ideal of himself that is the self realization because self realization is the ideal of every individual and shall be one with law which he recognizes as that which he ought to obey that he ought to obey the law which he basically uh, is something uh, you know he has to render his obedience to that law. Now, the government therefore, in this opinion of course, this state government distinction also is quite significant because some of the thinkers at times do not make distinction between government and state. But for him this state in fact, if we use the term state then we believe that state has to create conditions where people could rise above their above the constraints which are normally there in the society due to which this uh, basically moral freedom could not be enjoyed or the free choice could not be exercised. Now, of course, when it comes to the government Green believed that government had to offer uh, you know free compulsory education, government had to offer has to offer you know health uh, and living uh, better healthy and living conditions, government has to give relief from poverty. Therefore, it is here that one find that Green is not simply talking about a positive liberty, but positive state and therefore, in the very beginning I mentioned that lot of people believe that Green's political thought can be considered as the beginning of this entire discourse of welfareism in the West that is the concept of welfare state that is you know, uh, over, you know, you know this over enveloping state where the state brings within its purview the all activities of society. And Green basically did not talk of welfare state the way it basically crystallized in 20th century, but the way Green talked of the conditions for the realization, self realization, the conditions for enjoyment of moral freedom, those conditions basically are very similar to what normally are understood as the welfare activities of the modern state. Now, Green for Green positive freedom is a moral freedom and that is acting according to reason, basically not according to interest and it is here this interest dimension comes to the fore because earlier liberals uh, while talk, talking of freedom gave importance only to uh, you know the interest. And if utilitarians talked of this happiness and pleasure there are other liberals who talked of this matter in a different way, but nonetheless interest uh, you know uh, determine this entire uh, you know uh, search for freedom entire quest or entire discourse of freedom. But here Green tries to move away from that framework and for him it is basically positive freedom is a moral freedom and it is according to acting according to uh, reason not interest. Now, this moral freedom uh, basically emerges through goodwill that everyone has two different types of will goodwill and actual will and this basically uh, reminds one of Rousseau particularly his contract argument when he talks of particular will and the general will and when basically one rises about the particular and thinks about the larger interests of the society then on basis of that will if something is created in fact Rousseau would argue that it is basically reflection of general will. So, similarly in green also uh, we bring uh, you know we find this entire argument of goodwill uh, surfacing in a big way and basically this goodwill uh, green identifies with this ideal self of, of the individual when one rises ever one self interest, one narrow interest, one short uh, interest and basically thinks about the larger community 
about others, not only about rights, but about duties. And that is perhaps uh, the goodwill. And this moral freedom is based on this concept of good, goodwill, where individual rises over narrow sectarian interests. Now, Barker, one of uh, you know, the celebrated commentator uh, on Western political thought as a whole and the English political uh, philosophy uh, in particular, uh, believes that for Green, liberty is not absence of restraint, but rather it is a positive power of doing or enjoying something worth doing and enjoying. And this is something very important as a definition of freedom, that enjoying something worth doing uh, or uh, worth enjoying. So basically, the positive capacity, the power, capability of individuals of uh, doing and enjoying something worth doing and worth enjoying. Now, what happened, uh, you know, but one thing is very, uh, you know, important here to remember that this enjoying, this positive power of enjoying or doing, which is worth doing and worth enjoying, it is uh, basically in tune with or in consonance with the similar power of the others. Uh, in fact, it is not. Uh, something which has to be seen uh, as running against the interests of the others or similar powers of the other. So therefore, what one shares in common with the other members of community, that is perhaps the freedom. And it is here, this one finds a very refreshing uh, difference between the earlier liberal thinkers and Green, if we basically consider him as a part of the liberal discourse. Though, as I mentioned in the very beginning, that there are many writers, many scholars who normally club them or put green uh, in the company of the idealist thinker, largely on account of this moral dimension of freedom, the way he talks of community identity of individual, not a kind of uh, laissez-faireism, which was basically the dominant creed of liberalism at the time. So therefore, if we uh, basically include him within the liberal discourse in the sense that uh, he was trying to provide moral foundation, but nonetheless, his entire thing has to be seen within the broad orientation called liberalism. So now, it, what happens here that this you know entire thing of worth doing and worth enjoying that is the positive power, the freedom as positive power, which is basically one of the defining feature of positive liberty or positive freedom. Uh, Green argues that this has to be in common with others. That is, it should not endanger or hamper the interest of others. So this commonality of interests or the commonality, commonality of human life that human beings only as part of the larger community and the society should never be lost sight of. Now, David Miller, another important commentator on uh, Green, uh, he finds the three elements in his this concept of positive freedom. And this is something interesting. He says that if we look at Green's entire definition of freedom, the moral freedom, then we find three different elements coming into the, you know, the discussion or the picture. The first is that capacity to do, this positive power to do. And this is uh, purely individual, uh, that this is individualistic, uh, you know, in tinge. I mean, this is basically, this element uh, basically highlights the individualism in him. That's capacity to do, the, you know, the, this you know this positive power to do. The second is uh, that you know the must must be worth doing. He said freedom is something this positive power to do something which is uh, basically you know uh, worthy of doing. So worth doing. And here he says Miller says that it is a moral uh, framework which he brings in in in, in his discussion discussion of freedom, the moral framework. And the third he says that be enjoyed in common with others, that human beings should strive for moral freedom. That is basically the positive power to do things which are worth doing and worth enjoying. This is the definition of freedom. But number one, this is the positive power that is capacity to do, which is individualistic in nature. Number two, that it must be worth doing and it is moral that what is worth, what is worthy and what is not worthy. It is a question of judgment and therefore he brings in moral dimension here and the third is that it should be enjoyed in common with others so he brings in the social dimension that whatever individuals enjoy that should not be in isolation from the larger enjoyment of other members of the society so therefore according to miller all these three elements are accommodated nicely in his definition of uh, freedom 
the individual, uh, individualistic, the moral as well as the social. Now, these three conditions of course, ac according to Miller are not independent of each other, but for you know moral freedom all, all three uh, to be you know exercised. Uh, you know, not dependent on each other, but all three have to be exercised. Then only one can say that one is basically uh, striving for moral freedom, or one is enjoying moral freedom. Unless all three, this individual, the social, and moral, are not uh, brought together, this moral freedom discourse, one cannot claim that one is striving for and one is enjoying. So therefore, this is how we have to look at his idea of basically freedom that is moral freedom. The next question uh, which he addresses and that is also very significant is the question of rights. And as we know that rights from the very beginning uh, have been one of the important issues uh, in western political thought uh, in modern times as well as perhaps earlier, but in modern times it has come out very prominently. And the first important uh, discourse on rights basically we find in Locke particularly on natural rights. Of course, there are other streams uh, of political thought who talked of legal rights, even people trace this entire concept of legal rights in Hobbes also. But what we find that in Green, there is a very interesting uh, relationship which he creates between uh, liberty rights and the state. And he says that liberty postulates rights and rights demand the state. This is the most celebrated statement uh, coming from Green that liberty postulates rights and rights demand the states. Now, unlike you know the other social contract theorists like Locke and others, uh, Green does believe that rights uh, come from natural law. Uh, rather, he believes that rights are uh, you know have a moral character. Uh, you know they emerge from the moral character of man because man is basically uh, endowed with this moral capacity where it realizes its duties towards other it realizes or it understands and acts on its obligation towards others particularly the society and the community so therefore unlike this uh, you know this uh, social contract theorist like locke he doesn't believe in uh, this natural law rather he relates rights with the moral character of man now, according to Green, that each individual recognizes his fellow individual and his concerns and his rights or her concerns and rights and therefore, that is the ideal object where every human being pursues in society. So, therefore, the moment he initially said that man is a moral and rational agent, then of course, these things have to flow from that position and they are definitely flowing. So, he is saying that each individual recognizes his fellow individual and therefore, that is the ideal object uh, for a person to be pursued. Now, man therefore or a woman therefore in Green's framework becomes a moral agent in society. Now, what happened that uh, you know there is no class uh, normally as it has been understood uh, within the liberal tradition that there are different interests and those interests are in conflict with each other and this is how uh, basically the uh, you know space for politics is created because after all politics is there to reconcile those conflicting interests. But here in green we find that he makes individual a moral agent and therefore basically subordinates the interests uh, of individual to that uh, morality and therefore he uh, feels that you know there is no class of interest rather you know there is a uh, possibility of interdependence rather there is a inter interdependence among various interests in society. Now, Green uh, also believe that right, uh, rights need recognition, uh, but that does not mean that uh, you know uh, without recognition uh, some of the rights uh, will not have the stature of uh, you know the rights at all. For example, not all rights are legal rights. For example, recognition means that you know rights have to be given a legal framework, the rights have to be recognized by law. But according to Green, that not all rights are legal right. And therefore, here uh, one finds uh, that you know the genuine rights in opinion of Green uh, need not recognize, uh, need not uh, you know be recognized by the state, even without recognition of the state, if the rights are genuine, then they can uh, be called the rights and uh, basically in, in, but the recognition dimension if at all is necessary in the opinion of green the recognition has to be on basis of the moral consciousness of the community so here instead of a state he brings in community 
uh, into the discussion. So therefore, this is something in, in, you know, important here because normally in the entire discourse of rights, particularly the legal theory of rights or even the idealist theory of rights, they would put the state at the center of the discourse because unless rights are basically those needs which are recognized by the state, then only they become rights. But here, Green is taking a position that uh, there are certain genuine rights uh, which even without the recognition by the state can become rights if they have the recognition of the moral consciousness of the community. So community impact uh, becomes uh, central to this entire discourse of rights so far Green is concerned. Now uh, basically in this sense one can say that Green is talking about uh, you know the ideal rights not the legal rights. Now uh, rights when it comes to rights Green would also say that the rights are organized on the goodwill of the people. And this is goodwill, which I was referring to earlier, which basically reminds one of the general will of Rousseau, is something where individuals, uh, you know, think uh, above their own sectarian narrow interests, and that is basically the interest which is basically in harmony with the similar interests of the other members, and creates a kind of interdependence and balance in the society. And it is on basis of this goodwill, which is the basically the moral foundation of this entire. Uh, discourse of Green that he believes that rights are organized. Now, for Green, the common moral consciousness uh, is important for recognition of rights uh, because uh, it is not the legislature uh, which can be given this uh, authority to recognize rights, but the common moral consciousness of the community that should be endowed with this power to recognize these rights. Now, as I mentioned earlier that you know this statement that liberty postulates rights, the freedom liberty postulates rights and rights demand a state basically is a statement uh, which automatically brings the three things together that is uh, you know liberty, rights and the state. Now how he looks at the state that is something interesting and this becomes interesting largely on account of the fact that uh, this confusion the idealist or a liberal, a liberal idealist because of number of arguments which basically gel nicely with this idealist orientation whether it is a moral foundation or a self realization or you know the conditions and so on and so forth. But at the same time unlike uh, idealists he does not give unbridled power to a state he does not give the full uh, you know amount of uh, you know uh, I mean unquestioned political obligation to the extent that many people believe that Green also gives the right to resistance to the people which no idealist would basically concede. But Green does it and therefore he does not break from his liberal antecedents at any stage so far as the question of uh, you know rights obligation and uh, basically uh, the liberty is concerned. Now what Green uh, says that a state is the product of the moral consciousness of the community. And he does not leave this question of moral morality or the moral consciousness of the community at any stage uh, in his discourse on uh, rights in the state. For Green, human cost consciousness postulates liberty, liberty involves rights and rights demand a state. And this is how the state has uh, its important uh, role to play in the social context. Now a state therefore is necessary for basically uh, making rights. Uh, in fact, a state's presence unlike you know the liberal necessary or unnecessary evil uh, you know discussion he does basically indulge with a state away he says that a state is necessary for rights. Now a state how he looks at the state that is uh, also quite significant here. He looks at a state as the instrument of perfection uh, not as an embodiment of perfection. So this uh, embodiment and instrument these two words are important because a liberal uh, a, an, an idealist would not call a state as instrument rather they would basically call it an embodiment and this is how perhaps Hegel also uh, looked at it. This is how the other idealists have also looked at it. But when it comes to Green we find that he looks at a state as an instrument of perfection that no no, no doubt this perfection uh, business is an important business of the state because a state uh, makes things perfect by creating conditions by basically uh, hindering the hindrances as he defined that you know it has to hinder the hindrances from the path of the moral upliftment of man. But nonetheless 
He believes that it is an instrument of perfection, not embodiment of perfection as normally the idealist philosophers would argue. Now, according to Green, a state should respect the moral consciousness of community. So, there are certain constraints under which the state has to continuously work, uh, unlike idealists, because idealists would not require any constraints on the uh, working and the functions of the state, but Green, Green puts it. And for example, one of the important conditionality which he puts is this moral consciousness of community. Now, so far as the functions of the state are concerned, uh, Green uh, argues that maintenance of the conditions of life, particularly morality and freedom are the two important uh, you know conditionalities uh, and they constitute the important function of the state. Now, morality of course, he looks at it as a disinterested performance of one's duty in social and co social context that is perhaps morality in the opinion of Green. Now, therefore, what we find that state's intervention uh, is invited or is granted in Green, there is no doubt about it unlike many other liberals and this has started with J.S. Mill as I was mentioning earlier, but Green took it to more a uh, higher plane and he basically endorses state intervention, but with a condition only for a welfare of the citizens. And this also in course of time became the condition for the resistance which individuals were uh, granted the right to resistance. That individuals could uh, resist the state if it thought that it was not serving uh, the interest of the people, the welfare of the people. Now, when it you know when we come to the question of property. Uh, interestingly, uh, Green uh, upholds it and there is nothing surprising about it because uh, both liberals and idealists have been uh, basically supporting this the right to property uh, because for Green uh, this as a realization of will. In fact, property is required for the realization of will because uh, what happened uh, that uh, this property, this entire fulfillment, the self realization uh, requires this institution of property. Now, freedom of property therefore, uh, in fact is granted, but nonetheless he also argues that if property acts as a hindrance, then there is a kind of there is a puzzle in green, then what he would recommend? Would he recommend the abolition of because first of all, uh, you know this uh, freedom implies that self realization or basically all hindrances be removed from the path of the self realization. If but at any stage property starts acting as a hindrance, then what would be uh, you know the position of green and it is here that one find a kind of silence in green uh, which he does not address uh, as clearly as he perhaps uh, uh, you know addresses other issues. And when it comes to uh, you know this question, he basically shifts the blame from capitalism to feudalism and he basically blames the landed property uh, you know uh, as the for the creation of the proletariat or for example, he uh, blames this entire feudal order, the feudal system of the medieval period for all the predicaments in the society not the capitalist production or uh, the capital. And it is here C. B. Macpherson uh, in his book. Uh, theory of possessive individualism uh, believes that Green uh, basically uh, condoned this entire thing because he did not have any uh, you know solution to offer or any new idea uh, to offer in terms of uh, property acting as any hindrance. The next question uh, in Green is the question of political obligation on which he also wrote a book as I mentioned 1885. Now, this is political obligation is a question which not only Green addresses, but most of the thinkers uh, in the West have addressed this question that is why do we obey the state, that why we should render our obedience to the state and Green also comes to this question. Now, but his answer of course, uh, is more or less now uh, clear from what we have discussed about his position on liberty rights and the state. Now, according to Green, law and state are the moral uh, you know consciousness of the community and therefore, the only restraint uh, you know or the constraint which puts on this political obligation is the moral consciousness of community. At any stage, if a state uh, militates against that consciousness, then the people have the right to resist. No unconditional obedience like other idealists perhaps would argue. Uh, you know, Green grants, uh, you know, in his 
political ideals. Now, uh, you know, organized power of community, uh, not the state, that is the authority. Even when it comes to the definition of authority, he said the organized power of community. He does not call it the organized power of the state. Now, individuals allegiance therefore, in Green's political thought is to society, uh, not to the state. A political ob obligation therefore, one can argue in Green's political thought becomes the pursuit of the common good. Now, what happens that therefore, that uh, this common interest, common welfare, common good, general will or the general interest, these are basically the running themes in the political thought of Green, not the self interest as it was very prominent in this entire utilitarian discourse. And from this point of view of political obligation as I mentioned that what is also interesting to see that he gives uh, you know the right to uh, resist that is every individual has a right to resist which idealists normally do not give. And he says that right to resist largely uh, basically is based on this idea of common good that at any stage if a state functions against the common good the individuals have would have the right to resist. Now, this consciousness of common good is therefore, the basis of duties, because I mentioned that the moment here you know green makes you know human beings are moral agents and therefore, make it interdependent with the other agents of the society, other members of the society and from there that you know what flows is this entire concept of duties and therefore, that duties is becoming the consciousness of the common good in Green's political thought. Now, individual community relationship in Green's opinion is quite intimate and therefore, one cannot be seen working as against the other or militating against the other. Now, it is here that we should also remember his famous statement that will not force is the basis of a state. That will, that is the will uh, you know people have willed for this state because a state it believes has or is going to hinder the hindrances. So, therefore, this is a statement that what is a state and what is the basis of a state origin of a state that different theories of the origin of a state in political theory. Many people would make force as the basis of a state, some people some thinkers have made class as the basis of a state, but Green would say that it is will not force is the basis of a state. So, therefore, what we find that the way he started the way he basically tried to temper his entire political thought with uh, moral you know uh, argument. Uh, similarly, he ends this question of political ab obligation and resistance with that uh, moral uh, you know argument and he says that uh, you know the obedience has also to be based on this common consciousness of common good. Now, in fact, uh, what we find that Green's political thought over the years uh, you know have has inspired whole host of scholars who have tried to build this entire question of political obligation on morality. Now, for example, uh, Harold Losky, one of the leading uh, voices in political theory in 20th century uh, took this discourse further, which we will discuss in our next lecture. Harold Losky ruled out unconditional poli political obligation and when he ruled out unconditional political obligation, uh, he argued that if the government claims obedience, uh, it should have to compete with other associations in terms of uh, you know the discharge of duties. So, therefore, this entire obligation is contingent on what a state does, how it delivers in the interests of the people and the society. So, therefore, what the foundation green uh, you know the foundation which green laid for this moral framework of political obligation in course of time uh, kept on expanding and 20th century we find that it merged with the entire uh, discourse on welfareism and so on and so forth. So, therefore, Green's political thought you know occupies or basically uh, Green's political thought has a significance which uh, is basically unmatched in terms of harmonizing the concerns of liberalism and idealism uh, to great extent, because he uh, basically gave the moral foundations uh, to this liberalism. And that is why you know I am reminded of C. L. Wapper, one of uh, the interesting commentaries on western political thought, when he said that Green uh, made idealism moral and social and British civilized and safe. So, when he made this statement, uh, I think it carried lot of weight that it was that contribution of Green uh, was not only in terms of making idealism moral and social, but the kind of moral turbulence which the British society was witnessing. 
which to some extent John Stuart Mill was also trying to address. In fact, uh, Green took it further and provided a more solid foundation on basis of which lot of new theorizations and new thinkings as emerge in 20th century and that is why Green today is rated as one of the most uh, you know important or one of the most important voices emanating from the western world so far political thought is concerned. I will stop here. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Jha for this enriching lecture and thank you friends for watching stay tuned and keep watching thanks a lot. Thank you sir.